banana and bears raw beef pod. Oh, welcome everybody to another very special of the mini mid series of the banana and bear rugby pod. This is uh, that mini series we we talked about. We've won possibly two out already. No, we won out already. But we are going to teach you how to rugby rugby. This is the one we were talking about before, where we were going to give it to you for the lay person. I'm going to just tag along on Anna's, aka bananas coattails of uh, high level elite rugby and ask her the kind of questions that I know you'll be wanting to know and basically it makes you makes you a little bit craftier down the pub so at least you know roughly what has happened what's about to happen or what somebody has just shouted at the television for so you don't sound like complete wally you can keep this in your back pocket these short little mini series and how to one, shout at the telly we should call it ex- we should actually how to shout at the telly but in all fairness that's me now at everything I just <laughs> <laughs> By the way, hello Anna. How are you? This was oh, really... good now. How are you? Oh, Just geez. hiding away in the corner there. As if we we hadn't uh, as if we hadn't been talking for the last twenty minutes beforehand. But this is yeah. it, this is how to rugby rugby, and we've got I've gotten requests as to when the next one is coming because they're like I need more rugby man because we're coming up we're coming up as we release this we'll be coming up to the final pool stages and turning the corner into a uh, big boy school after that. So it's time to kind of. Knuckle down. We gave you the full overview roughly on what rugby is, and it has helped a few people. Um, this one is going to be positional. So we're going to, Anna and myself are going to run from 1 to 15 and possibly just give you a brief overlook of who you might have on the bench as well from, uh, I suppose, 16 to 23, because you're, you know, you're allowed seven or whatever. But more importantly, the 1 to 15 and kind of loosely what their roles are. So you don't have to get too... Dog- like Nobody is going to take up the sport and play this position as a result of hitting, hearing this podcast. But... Well, you never know. You'd never know. And if you are a complete nurse out there and you're kind of going, oh, I can't believe they didn't talk about like, you know, how you strap up your knuckles or foot placements. I'm like, no, relax. This is for... Joe and Josephina blogs. This is for people who are just turning their turning their head and going. Maybe this rugby thing is maybe it's worth paying a bit of attention to. Well, this is purely to give you an idea as to why we love it so much. Um, and I'm going to try and curtail Anna ever so slightly from not making this a nine hour podcast because she <laughs> she can give you song and verse on everything. So, I, like I said, I'll keep yeah. this for the for the lay person. So in you keep me in check. Keep you in check, and especially when we get to the back row, because that's where Anna loves. She loves smashing people running off the back of scrums. So uh, when we get to like say six, seven, eight, you'll notice I'll start to have to push her a small bit because <laughs> that's what she loves to do. But we'll start with, and we'll give a we'll give a player so people can actually reference it then as well. So we'll start obviously where else? Number one, um, Lucy Goosey, Lefty Lucy, uh. If you'd like to, who so who 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 would be your favorite? Who's your favorite number one? Um, I mean, I actually, do you know what's funny about it? Mm. When you say it, I'm like, is that is that one is that one number one or number three? <laughs> yeah, I know. I get the props all the time. Well, do you they know what love, Andrew love. Porter and Keen Healy are doing us no favors because they've they've swapped over and back. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Lefty Lucy, righty tighty, and that's exactly that's how you know if anybody's going. I can't, I can't work out which one is loose head and which one is tight head. Number one and number three, they're on either side of what would be the bolt that is the hooker in number two. We'll get to that. Lefty Lucy, um, yeah, okay. That's always a good way to remember. It. I think that's how the props themselves remember it. To be fair, God bless them. They, yeah, that's <laughs> that's. <laughs> You're like which which one am I again? Well, especially I'm, if you're switching over and back. I'm, but I'm I know, Lucy today. Like, I'm Lucy. Okay, I'm righty tighty. Okay. Well, I think what's interesting in general, in terms of like when you're a back row, um, and you're doing scrum prep and scrum training, like you, a lot of the time, you know, a coach will bring in all the forwards for scrum time, and they spend so long like setting up and preparing the front row because the front row is the anchor of the scrum. Mm-hmm. The back row is often just have to stand and watch so I've spent a lot of time standing and watching coaching of the front row um so yeah like I mean it depends what what your strengths are there's very specific um angles or placement of shoulder blades and arms and elbows as to how like that differs between 
jersey number one and jersey number three? Are you going to like try and, and angle in or push someone into the scrum? Are you trying to break them apart? Like that's very specific and can differ a lot between number one and number three. Um, so uh, like the, the interesting thing about front rows in general and props uh, is how dynamic they've become. That's it, but yeah. Jesus, you see, you see, but even last night, you see fucking Ben Tamifuna, like the heaviest oh my God. player oh my God. in the World Cup, like, you know, and what, like, they have to be so athletic, like gone are the days when you were only on the pitch to scrum and then just get in the way otherwise, <laughs> like, you have to be so <laughs> dynamic and so fit strong, you know. So number one typically um, would be, I suppose, would be, uh, I guess, it's Andrew Porter on the Irish team at the minute. Um, Dave Gilcoyne as well plays there, but it's it's they they would be deemed for one reason or another. They would be deemed almost less important for whatever reason than number three. We're kind of talking number one and number three here. We'll come back to number two because number one and number three are the props left and loose, left and lefty yeah. loosey, righty tighty. But for some, I, I guess they're. Do scrums typically angle in on themselves, in on the three? Why is why is the three more of a linchpin than the number one? Because, so when you say tight head, um, the difference between tight head and loose head is that if you've got, you know, th the three on three, one of you has a head in between the two heads uh -huh. opposite, which is the tight head, and the loose head on the other side of the scrum, which is the, the, the number three, so for the his or her head is on the outside. So for the people listening right now, if you take your two hands and bend your and just your three it's fingers, literally in the what middle. I was just doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your three fingers in the middle, and line up your ring finger with the other ring finger, and the one ring finger has to go between your middle and ring finger. Well, that's the head of the tight head prop, and they've got to battle a fucking head on either side. They'll end up with the two cauliflower ears. They've got to deal with it on yeah. either side of them. Whereas the the person on the outside, the number one, just has to kind of shove their head in the way a small bit to, I guess, a very important job too. But at the same time, if you can handle two bullocks driving in on your head on both sides, you probably get a bigger paycheck. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, very valuable player. Um, um it's yeah, that's why the 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 loose head, as it said, is uh is there to oh sorry. I actually mixed them up there, didn't I? Did I say them in reverse? No, you didn't. No, 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 because I was lining my fingers up as you were talking and we got there, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, because I, I, I do that. This is all my hours standing and watching and I'm like, will these fuckers ever get it right? And I'm there like, and I'm still, I mix them up. Um, which one is loose and tight? Like I have to do the thing on my hands or I have, yeah. have to like look at the scrum to figure out which one is which. But like the loose head does imply that, that you're the one in the out side your head is on the outside so you have a little bit of power in terms of how you can angle yourself and disrupt the opposition scrum and how you can shape the front row and and, and drive it forward because ideally all you're trying to do is drive forward but when you're coming up against like fucking strong scrums you need to be a bit more savvy like how are you going to drive forward you need to niggle them some way find a weak spot find a weak link you know there's a lot of um if you're doing like a video analysis of like your scrum a good way to look at it is you know that overhead camera we'd get yes. the camera angle of that if we'd watch on the telly on the telly and you'd see is someone angling in which is which is illegal actually but but how to do it savvy and how to like move your body to find a crack in the opposition scrum because eight fully grown men against in eight fully grown men in this world cup obviously when we play it's women <laughs> but um you know it's like when an immovable object meets a unstoppable force kind yes. of a thing. You need to find a way through. Um, so without that's why scrum is like, like, so illegal. interesting, really. Yeah, without looking, because it's all about painting these pictures. You'll hear them talking, oh, he's painting a great picture. And the idea is, if for all the world, Andrew Porter's arse starts pointing out towards the touchline, you know he's up to something. He's trying to turn into it. So these people are able to do this shit from, from the shoulders up which is scary yeah. to have that kind of yeah, power yeah, yeah. on the shoulders up. Um, and obviously, as Anna said, it isn't just all bending over and pushing in the in the scrum and the dark arts, as they call it. But it's um, 
they have to be dynamic and they have roles around the pitch now as well, which has completely changed. But then again, yeah. so has everybody. So I suppose we'll just give the fundamentals really. I mean, that's the name of their, you know, does what it says on the tin. They're called that because that's the most important job that they have. But you're referring to the dark arts there. Like dark arts is a very like rugby niche, it? no yeah. one's kind of freeze. What it means is uh, it's kind of like, um, I think people, or coaches in the Southern Hemisphere start to refer to it as the dark arts. Basically, stuff you can learn that can is potentially and maybe at one stage might become illegal but basically tricks on how to like bring down your opposite player or stuff that can go unnoticed that's not not harmful or not going to cause injury but in some way bending the rules and pushing the boundaries of the rule I shouldn't say rules because people get very upset about this about the laws of the game mm. so that's what the dark arts is on about when you hear people on about the, da- the dark arts I have, a, I have a great example of the dark arts that um that Ireland pulled off during against South Africa, and oh, yeah. I th- I thought I was imagining it, and then a very insightful Johnny Johnny Holland, uh, a former Munster player, described yeah. it on a podcast, and you know that one where they got the scrum penalty and Murray was on, yeah. and I was yes. like, how how did they pull this off? Well, he watched it, I guess on whatever HD he was watching, and he he saw something. Oh, I thought I did, and then I went, no, it's all down to Murray. He's that cool. They feigned. The entire eight of them, and he said, "You'll only get away with this probably once in a tournament, because it'll be, it'll be, they'll go back over it again and have a look." All eight, it's a move that he's, it's as old as time, and all eight, when they engaged at the beginning, all eight feigned actually taking the taking the strain, but they didn't. All eight at the same time collectively of the Ireland team went soft before the ball was put in, and allowed. Of course, a big marauding South Africa to go, well, fucking come on and shove us. And of course, Murray was in on the gag and it showed just too much dynamic movement. Ref was like, ye greedy bastards and give a penalty. Because of course, a ref, most refs are normally of back back origins. So he wouldn't have a blind, a, a clue what was going on in that scrum. That yeah. was, I mean, that was just what Johnny Holland described. And I was like, okay, that makes that's, perfect genius. But that's, perfect. that's not, that's not so uncommon. We would have done that a lot saying you just look around and you'll say like, um, don't take the hit. Yeah. Yeah. And like yeah. When, when you hit, you just kind of step back, which makes it look like the other team is pushing early. <laughs> it's so cheeky. And right? we'd say that a lot. We'd be like, they're not taking the fucking hit. Like shouting at the ref about the other team. <laughs> Because it because it happens an awful lot. The only thing in the not South African really accents when somebody's shouting at you, they're not taking the bloody hit. You're like, relax, will you? Not everybody wants to hit you all the fucking time, you freak. Just chill out. <laughs> Just chill out. Well, um, okay, so we have our we have our two props, lefty loosey, righty tighty. I think the big thing for a lot of people was they didn't know why they were called that, and this is a brilliant description. And just essentially, like we said, they're dynamic in lots of other places. But then again, nowadays, so are so many other players. So we'll move into uh, the second row, also known as the engine room. Which you I skipped the hooker. I did. I skipped the hooker. I beg your pardon. Number two, which yeah. would be of, of, I guess, at this stage, it could be any three on the Ireland team. You could be looking at Dan Sheehan, um, uh, Rob Herring, or Ronan Keller. Ronan Keller. Exactly. Ronan Keller. Um. So Hooker, so, describe the name and, and the re- the reasons thereof, please, Anna. Sorry, it's actually funny because we only refer to the props there in terms of the scrum, but obviously the Hooker, when it comes to the line-out, has a really important role. Yeah. But the, the props in the line-out as well, usually you'll have the props as the book ends, you'd call them in the line-out, so either end, because if you have a prop in the middle of the line-out, it means they're probably not going to jump, which means you don't have to defend <laughs> that space. Yes. Um, so usually they go either end of the line out, but uh, the hooker then has a really important role in both the scrum and the line out. So hooker generally is thrower into the line out and then comes scrum time. They're the middle player at the, the, the front line, the front row of the scrum. And they're the ones to kind of set up first. They'll like pick the space when the ref gives the mark that you'll see the ref like kick the ground um, and say there's your mark the, the hooker the number two is the one who uh, sets off the mark then he look at the mark and say okay there's the middle there's my foot and then every other player the two props the second row set off the hooker so the hooker is very important from that respect as well and hooker 
been born out of the name as a result of when the scrum half puts the ball in, he hooks the ball. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> to hook the ball, yeah. Sorry, I forgot that. And for all the, the many, many things that, that the hooker will do around the field, that was the one job that they picked and went, that's what we'll name it, the hooker. Not the healer, because <laughs> they use the back of their heel. Not the thrower of or the darts thrower. Nothing. Yeah. They went, Yeah. he kind of hooks the ball a bit. So let's go yeah. with hooker. I mean, it's an unfortunate name in some ways, but it is what it is. That's the name. In That's rugby the... circles, in rugby circles, you only know when you're talking to someone non rugby when they laugh at the word hooker. I know, I know. I'm. This is me. I'm. Don't see a problem with it. And now I'm going think like an, a person who has never seen rugby before. Don't think like a person who's never seen rugby before. Well, so... exactly, because you have to think about it that way. Because yeah, um, yeah, because that's how when you the... know when you're talking to someone who's on a rugby head and you're like, oh, the um hooker. Yeah, and you know they're going to say something or laugh. But you're right about the h- hooking the ball. Um. They, yeah, so the, they'll, the scrum half, you, sometimes you see the scrum half touch the hand of the hooker because the hand of the hooker will be around the prop on the left-hand side and the scrum half always puts the ball in on the left of the scrum in 15s um, and he'll touch the hand of the hooker or he'll give some signal to let him know that the ball is coming in and then the hooker is able to lift his leg because the hooker's not allowed to lift his leg before the ball comes in. Exactly. So he can't be there waiting you have to keep both legs in the ground. And also there was a recent rule change about using a brake leg. So the, the hooker also has to kind of keep a foot out in front of him to make sure the scrum doesn't like, he's got kind of control, like a handbrake, they call it, um, of all the, the, the forwards aren't going to push him forward. It's Yeah, you'll see them throw out their leg, almost like a, a prop. I, I Ironically, it's almost like a, a, a prop you would see against the side of a building or something like that. It's, it's, it is yeah. a, it is a much safer thing and the hand the re, the great thing I guess about the hand and the fact that the foot needs to be kept down that just the tips of his fingers will all he'll you'll see Murray or somebody like that just tap the ball on his fingers but the great thing is all six players up the front their faces are looking straight down to the ground so they don't know when the ball has been tapped off anybody or when it's coming in only the hooker really knows it because it's his hand gets the ball tapped so he can be lightning fast it's been done a million times on the training park so they they're tied in intrinsically with each other. Um, and of course, as you said, throwing in at the line out, very, very, I mean, Jesus, would you want that job? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah, have to it goes be... wrong so often for them as well. And they are the first one to get blamed. And it could be a, yeah. a, it could be a, a late lift. It could, we will talk about that in our next episode too um, when we talk about the set piece. So those are, are the rules of the two of them. That's the name, the name of the number two. So we, we can move now on to, into the engine room. Number four and number five, which who are normally, typically, and maybe you can explain why, are the tallest players on the field. Yep, the locks, four and five. Um, tall, I suppose, for their role in the line-out because they're usually the jumpers or the line-out operators. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's handy to have tall players in the second row. Well, tall isn't so necessary, um, but more so, like, strong and, like, heavy. Yes, Um. Mm-hmm. So they can like put real pressure on the front row in terms of like pushing them forward as soon as the ball is in. So um boring position on the pitch, I would say. I it's guess fucking you... hard. I'm joking, but by, by the way, I I I I love the second rows. Hard position though, your your jaw gets sore as the second row oh, because you put your so. fucking head in between the hips of the front rows. Yeah. And front rows hips tend to be the biggest hips on the field. It isn't like little yeah. minuscule little hips are going to be rubbing off your ears and your jaws. Um, yeah. they, they, those are the people who typically get gnarly ears, gnarly ear damage when they get gnarly yeah. ears. They're, um, so they probably all... the most, they should be the most likely to wear a scrum cap, but I feel like they're also the players who give the least fucks. So <laughs> they're, they're normally the ones that I think because you have to be so aggressive in there because you're literally putting your head between two arses and shoving. I yeah. think typically they, if you think Paul O'Connell, um, Martin Johnson, you know, a lot of these people, you know, Evan Edzabed, they love a good old schmuzzle too. <laughs> I guess the blood is up like, when you're doing yeah. things like that. You know, it's not like you're out watching things happen and stuff. You're like, you just tell me when I need to drive and just shove like hell. I mean, that's a, that's a bull of a job. So... Yeah, and you said it's all about engine room, like, well, engine room in terms of the scrum, but also, like, around the pitch, 
the fucking the second rows because of their size and because typically and I'm I'm actually referring specifically to men's rugby here because yeah. women's rugby can be a bit more adaptable um but across second and back row I feel like there's less of a difference between the players in second and back row than there were in the sizes and shapes than there is in the men's game in the men's game it's very much still tall in the second row and smaller in the back row whereas it can change a little bit for the women's game but um, because of their size, you know, even like if you picture Paul O'Connell carrying the ball, his big long legs and the big huge strides, it's not so dynamic. Mm-hmm. So actually, second rows, it was probably a pure accident that Paul O'Connell got the ball whenever he did, yeah. because actually, the second rows generally will hang around as support players just to clean out rocks. They don't tend to be the number one ball carriers all the time because of their size. They're not so dynamic. And they t- they talk about this being the the unforeseen donkey work. You'll often hear him saying it, and it's because I guess when somebody you know tipping the scales at 115, 120 kgs and six foot six or whatever drives themselves into a ruck like a fucking tent peg, they will yeah. drive beyond it and clear clean out that ruck again. We will be explaining well, rucks in the next episode. So the I mean they're great for that kind of stuff, and they're massive. They've got long arms, well, you know. They're yes and. Thank God for... Well, they're often clumsy as well, though. Yeah. And they, they drop the ball a lot to second rows, I find. Yeah. But they... Um, thank God for stats, because second rows will have done an awful lot of unnoticed work over the years. But now that stats are, you know, a very important part of the game, you can actually see how much work players like that actually do. Because, you know, a coach has so many things to think about. He's not going to be watching... How many rocks did someone enter? They've, they're they watching the ball and the progress of the ball. So watching the support players enter a rock, you it's hard, very hard to keep track of. So thankfully now there are stats to give those players credit for how much work they do. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a very valid point. Now, I suppose people will go, wait one second. Tyg Byrne, doesn't he? Yeah, Tyg Byrne is a freak. So we can't really discuss freaks on this because they 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 throw the the rule book out the window. Kind of, yeah. They throw the rule book out the window. So we we're just going to go with the general status quo here on things. Also, as Anna was saying, they're they're great for the line out because they're typically tall, typically very good at it, and they're typically end up being the line out callers. I.e., the again something we'll explain in the next episode. But it's they're typically the people who. They'll call them, you know, the move, the position that the ball is going to be thrown into and stuff and, you know, linking it up of what's going to happen out the backs. Um, So they do, they do a hell of a lot of work that I would say probably the most uh, hiding in plain sight kind of work where you're like, ah, Grant, yeah, he did that. Where you're like, that was a really tricky thing. If you know what you're looking at, you're like, that was a really cool thing they did. A la Portugal, first ever World Cup try that we talked about uh, a yes. couple of weeks ago where... He did that no look pass, like he looked back in field, like he was gonna pass it maybe, uh, you know, to another player off while jumping up in the lineup. But he looked that way, and then he passed it back in the way to the blind side. Um. Also, oh yeah, we never. Do you know what? I don't know if we've ever explained the blind side. You know, we'll explain that when it comes to uh, the set piece in the next one. So I suppose that's yeah, that's I mean that kind of covers people enough on uh, four and five. The locks, they're called locks again. I guess they lock it all together like a nice. Nice, neat little bundle inside in the middle. They they tie in the arses and everything. And I think now it's as well to move on to Anna's favorite, favorite part of the pitch. So we have six, seven, and eight. <coughs> three very different. Um, three three very different positions. But well, they may six and seven. Let's let's talk six and seven first. Um. So what's the difference between six, six. and seven? Yeah. Let's. What's the difference? Yeah. Between, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll go with six just because it's in order of numbers. Yeah. Um, generally, if you had you know a couple of different types of shapes of player, you'd kind of try and get a sm- uh, smaller, stockier player to play number six because they do an awful lot of um tackling and they've got a lot of space to cover. So the six is the blind side flanker, which means they take the side of the scrum which is closer to a touchline. There we go. So you'll see a six and a seven swap sides of the rock, depending on... Now, different teams have different tactics. Again, like you say, w- except we can't cover all the exceptions to the rule here, and this is the general way that you know the, the positions have been taught and how they're, they're dealt with. The six takes the blind side. So 
what that means is if the opposition tries to attack on the blind side, and when I say blind side, I mean the shorter amount of space between a ruck and a touchline, mm-hmm. um, it's the six's responsibility to make either the first or second tackle, but you've got you have to make your tackle there as, as a six. The seven, um, and because most teams attack open. I want to say open, I mean the opposite of the blind side. So open side is where there's more space. Mm-hmm. The If the scrum is further away to the touchline and there's more space, that's the open side. So seven is a bit more ground to cover and they're usually aiming for, first of all, the number 10 because the number 10 is usually the first one standing there to attack from the opposition scrum. I'm talking about defensively now, obviously. Um, that's where the main differences come in between six and seven. Um if we change to like attack, um, usually the six will come late because the uh, generally, again speaking, if you attack open side, the seven is usually the first one to get to the rock. So they, you've got to be quick. They're generally quicker than the six because the six comes a bit late because she comes or he comes from the other side of the scrum. Um, so they might get to hit the second rock or the third rock, but the seven is usually has to be there as support um, or to clean out the, the first rock in, in attack or make the first tackle in defense. So generally speaking, the seven is a little bit skinnier and a little bit faster than the six, and the six has to be super strong and reliable defensively because they're one of the only defenders in that blindside space. You know, let's say a number seven missed her tackle, or his tackle, there are lots of other players in the open side to, yes. to make it, but the six, like, there's more pressure on the blind side. You have to make your tackles because you don't want to be dragging players over to the blind side to cover you. You have to make that. So that's kind of the, the biggest difference there between six and seven. And like a lot of players will cover both positions. So um, there's, not a, there's not a huge amount. A, a lot of players or a lot of... People tend to say there's more similarities between six and eight than there is yes. with seven because eight as well needs to be kind of stocky. The biggest difference for the eight to the, the to the six and seven is that the eight can carry the ball. Yes. Can pick up the ball from the end of the uh, scrum and run with it. So they've got to be a good ball carrier. Therefore, they need to be like big and strong. So that's why they're a little bit more similar in like body shape to the number six. And again, very generally speaking. Yes, Because this course. can all alternate between how, how, how teams decide they want to play themselves. Well, this, it can start to make sense. It'll definitely make sense for people when they start picking players in their head when they go, oh, yeah, because that's what... And okay, body shape may change slightly, but you can know the roles. Like you go, yes, O'Mahony, Van der Fli- Yes, okay, I can see what she's talking about there now. And now you can go watch the match and go, yes, Christ, yes, this makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it, it really does. Like, and I, for, for, say, the six Peter O'Mahony out on the blind side, typically it's just him and, I guess... James Lowe now but you know Keith Earls hence why they probably ended up being really good friends because they just had only each other to rely on for a lot of the time on these attacks but it's <laughs> it's a perfect perfect now that you can actually it's a perfect de- depiction you just made for people who have seen it and now you can replug it back in or who are about to watch the match at the weekend and go now mm. now I know what I'm seeing and now the eight as well yeah. the eight is the eight and the hooker are probably the two most um, I guess the, 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 it's it's they're the two only players really that get a get a go of the ball, both using their feet. You know what I mean? And both have to be yeah. pretty nifty because your head is down, shoving between either two heads or two arses, and you have to that ball comes yeah. skittering along. If you imagine, if you just help, just lean over on the desk now, and just somebody rolls something at you, you can't see it coming, and you got to be ready with your feet. So I mean, every so often yeah. you will see it so- squirt, squirt out. You know? Yeah, because if the, if something goes wrong, but that's why so. Generally, um, a, the role of the flanker, if you're on the side of, remember I was talking there about the scrum half tapping the the hooker on the hand to let him know that the ball's coming in. Yes. Generally, the flanker will call in the ball. So most teams, and you'll hear it on the ref's mic, they'll have you know a sequence like crouch and there'll be a response, bind and they'll say something else set and you'll usually it's hit two three but again it changes between teams mm-hmm. but that's one thing you'll hear hit two three 
and you'll hear the flanker saying something like, and to let the, the team know what's about to come in. And then they'll say, now, because like you say, they're watching the floor or they can't see the ball. So you need a signal to know when to push. Because if you push before the ball comes in, it's illegal. But you have to win the space when the ball comes in because that's when you're allowed to push. So um, usually the flanker who's next to the scrum half is watching the ball and they'll give the signal to the rest of the uh, players in the scrum to the, say the ball is in. The flanker is one of the few people who will only have their sho- one shoulder on and they'll have it on the more or less the, the left or the right butt cheek of the one of the props so they can actually swing their head around and look in underneath the engine of the well, what's happening so that again watch this for the next scrum that's a really really good insight so you'll either like that you'll see the flanker having a bit of a gawk in and, and calling but also ball. they shouldn't need to because <laughs> if you if the comms are good enough from the, the flanker who's right next to the scrum half and they give a good enough call. Nobody else needs to move one bit because they're listening instead of watching. Of course, listening of course. for when. Yeah, that's so. Um, um, yeah, that's a fantastic description. <clears throat> Excuse me, T went down the wrong pipe. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, it hasn't happened in ages, but it's just yeah, it's, it's, down the tea pipe. God, I wish I had just only a tea pipe. I'd love tea so much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I'm barking now like a seal in the background. Uh, great. So we've we've gotten we've gotten a, a brief overlook. So on um, and a great insights for what you can see now the next day on the telly when you're going ah class. So then you know the number eight is a dynamic player as well. Built typically like the six, or these days Christ is built like well one of the twelves. They're so monstrous now, but um loves loves a picking a picking goo as they say picking from the back back and, and just taking the hit setting everybody up first person in is normally number seven in after that as, as Anna described um number nine so number nine one of mo- the most unique I would say possibly the most unique position on the whole field it's a it's a yeah. one it's a one and done it's there's nobody else doing what they what the scrum half is doing on the pitch sure does not no and um- You'll have a lot of teams or coaches that'll say, you know, if you arrive at the ruck, you can you can pass it and if the ball is available, you can pass it, you can do the scrum half's job. But generally the scrum half knows what his or her job is like immediately. Mm-hmm. It's to um as soon as a tackle is made and a ruck is formed and the ball is ready, the scrum half, the number nine, is the one that's there, there to pass. So this is why for so long, you know, the, the scrum half has been the smallest player on the pitch because um, you've got to be nifty, you've got to be quick, you've got to be low to the ground um, because you're giving all those passes um, from the ground because the ball is placed on the ground behind the rock. You're passing from the, the ground every time to the 10 or to the forwards or for, for whoever is looking for the ball. Because the thing is, it's a contact sport, so the t- tackles happen every minute. And as soon as a tackle is made... There's either an offload or there's a rock. And if there's yeah. a rock, the scrum half is needed. So you'll see, you know, if you look at stats, and this is why, you know, I think people have got very interested in the positions on the pitch because of fantasy rugby. Of course. Um, scrum halves, because they do so much passing, they're actually not that valuable on a on a fantasy team because right. that's all they do. You know, and you'll see, like, Conor Murray is excellent for making breaks and scoring tries, but it's not that common for a... For no. a scrum half, because they know their role. Their role is to deliver the ball, um, and you don't get points for passing in fantasy rugby. Ah. So their sole role is kind of redundant ah, in fantasy right. rugby. So a lot of a lot of people will um, choose a, a scrum half for their fantasy rugby team that does something else as well, which might be kicking, or if there's someone like Conor Murray who snipes, and to snipe, you'll hear that a lot in commentary. To snipe means a someone who picks the ball from the back of the rock, usually the scrum half, it could be someone else, and runs with it um, instead of passing it and basically tries to get in over the gain line by sniping and running over it instead of passing it. I mean, there's, It's very there's, rare. You only do it when the defence isn't expecting it. it. There's Conor Murray and everybody else, really, isn't there? Like, when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> there was Mike Phillips for a while, who was tall yes. as well. But now and Conor Murray... 
Yeah, he's not so traditional, Conor Murray, because he's also very, very tall. Yeah, so he's, he's almost he's as tall as Peter O'Mahony. Like he's he's a big man, like you know, which I suppose yeah. offers a, a different a different dynamic. But you go all the way yeah. to the to the other monster scrum half, who's Craig Casey, who's five three, and who was you know he's a typical Peter yeah. Stringer character. You know the small and you know Faf de Clark. If you think yeah. of the the scrum yeah. halves in the in the World Cup, like you could just look at them and you know that they're the scrum half yeah. because of their build and as well. If you see their attitude, you know they're narky. They have to listen to the referee a lot, and they'll deliver the messages into whoever has their fucking head stuck inside in a rock. You know they have to connect with the referee a lot, so they often seem to be very barky and very annoying. They have to be bossy <laughs> yes. because they have to tell the forwards where the fuck to go, and they have to connect with like literally all the players. So I think scrum halves get kind of a bad rep as well because they're like, oh, he's very annoying. Like Fafta Clark, he's probably annoying, but everyone thinks he's such an annoying little shit because he's bossy, he's barking at people. He's bossing them around like you need that as a scrum half. You know, that's uh, that's kind of one of the characteristics of that that role on the pitch. It's um, it, but it, it comes with the territory, too. And it's not for not for ego purposes. They do it. If you imagine the actual dynamics of the scenario, if there is a again, we'll explain the rolling mall, but or a muck, a rock, I should say or a muck, you know what it means on some days. But <laughs> if everybody's face is buried and they're all driving like aggressive bulls at each other. They sometimes they do need to be screamed at. Whispering or asking them won't get it done. You'll see slaps on arses to get out of the way and all sorts because the number nine is the only player that links is the is both a forward and a back. If you know what I mean, even though they are they're down on the books as a back, they have to be stuck in with the forwards up against them, yeah. and then at the same time linking the ball to the backs. The, it's it's typically on a typical day. It's the only link yeah. between the two. So. They have to be super quick, thought process wise. I'd I'd love to know the 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 brain training they do because you have to be electric from minute one to minute eighty, don't you? Like you cannot switch yeah. off as a scrum half. Yeah, I think it's a natural thing for those players, and that's oh, how of they course. end up. Must be, the must player. be. And in defense, similarly to attack, in terms of like backing and ordering people around, um, often the scrum half stands behind the rock and not in the defensive line unless they're on their try line because there's no point standing behind a rock if mm. you know if the other team is very close you just have to get into the line usually they'll stand behind the rock when when they're out the field in defense and order the other players around like tell them like we need more players left or we need more players right and they'll call players by name and say you know Anna pull left or um push right we need more players this side or push up or push back or get up and um so usually that's their role in defence there then as well. Or now with the new fifty twenty two, you have a lot of scrum halves dropping back as a as a defender in the backfield as well. So, um, but it's the same thing. Huge communication, very noisy, uh, very chatty player. Hence why you will, I guess, for the 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 people, what lovers of the top fourteen. If you're out there, if you're thinking, you know what, I need to get into French rugby, you will every so often hear and being referred to as the. Petit general, isn't it? Be, you know, the little general, because that's what they must be. You need, you can't yes. all, you can't all have your heads down smashing things. Somebody's yeah. got to stand back and go right, okay. And you're aligning the troops essentially. Brilliant yeah. de description. So the the fanciest Dan, the fanciest Danet on the field, number ten, best hair typically. Um, yeah. The out half, the out half, the quarterback. Of the, the apparently pulls all the strings could be argued that it's of different players but the out half Anna why are they so important and what is their role I suppose to start with it we've just spoken about how the scrum half needs to be ordering and backing and communicating but it's the scrum half generally isn't making the decisions on that okay the 10 is making the decisions on it so the 10 is, you know, standing further away from the rock. They can see more. They're usually the smartest player on the pitch. You know, you'll be identified quite young as being, oh, he's a smart player. He should be the 10. Um, and you're basically making the decisions of, is it going to be a forwards ball? Is it going to be a backs ball? Should we go wide? Should we play short? Should we kick? Should I give it uh, out the back or to the crash ball or whatever it is? So, 
usually it's the 10 because they'll um be able to like just Johnny Sexton is like the perfect example. He can assess in, to, in real time, can't he? Like, yeah, exactly. And again, this is kind of the role of the outside backs has grown a little bit in in recent years in terms of giving information to the ten. But like, you can give all the information you want, but the decision and the call comes from the ten. Um, and you know, it's good to have that information come in from outside because the outside players can see space as well, recognize space. And, and feed in the information, but the 10 will make the call. Um, and because the 10 then can communicate directly with the nine. Um, the forwards can hear the call because, you know, the, the 10 is the first player that will stand back from the ruck. Um, uh, again, talking about attack here to start with. And uh, they are distributing the ball to the rest of the back line or to some forwards or to, but they're, they're the decision maker, essentially. They're the ones with the eyes up. They get information from other players around them, but they're the ones that, that, that make the decision about what play is going to be coming next or. Yeah. So that's simply why they're so important. And I guess, and in the next episode, we will talk about, uh, set plays as well as all of the forwards things. So sometimes when you see things happening, like a beautiful ballet, you're like, did they just run like that and hope for the best? A lot of the time, no. It'll, there'll be a name on it, much like in American football. There'll be a name on it, and they'll know what's what's happening next. Um, but we will explain that in in the next episode. Yeah, and of course, the the out half does the majority of the kicking. Majority, anyway. Sometimes, like Manny LeBoc, he can bottle it and have to have it taken over by the beautifully haired uh, number nine in Faf de Clerk. I I I'm just saying. Typically, my my number ten has to be a good kicker. That's that's just me. Your favorite player, Manny Lebock. <laughs> yes, usually they are because they can make that decision, and you can yes. get rid of the ball like quickly or just something that comes with the role. Like again, you'll see a, a lot of you know, fullbacks, wingers, scrum halves, like not so much centers because centers are a bit more attritional players, so they're not as um, don't need to be as skillful. But generally, it's the number ten on the back of the kicker's jersey. Um, again, other, other teams can change up as they wish, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a full package. If you're a 10 who can make decisions and kick, you're the full package. Beautiful, right? Um, I suppose we'll go numerically, even though it does, it isn't how it aligns on the field. Typically, it would align right next to the the 10 is the 12 and then 13, but we'll we'll go numerically back over to the blind side, number 11 winger. Um, and maybe we we'll talk about the two wingers at the same time to give co- contrast. Um, much like the the props, I guess, in the six and seven, the contrast between fourteen and eleven, it they're two very different positions, aren't they? The wingers, um, yes, um, and the more you play one, the more you get used to it. But generally, in terms of like physically, kind of there there there's not too much difference. I feel like the difference between two wingers is is smaller than the difference between the two flankers. Right. I I I think I I think that could uh, open to correction or open to argument there. But um, if you're quick and you can communicate space and you can connect with the players inside you, um, that's that's kind of that's just key to a winger on either side. Um, the blind side winger, which is number eleven, so we've gone from ten. I think a lot of people get confused about this. Yeah. I think I was confused about this when I started to learn about rugby first. It's like why are they listed the way they are? Like, why does it go 9, 10, and then the 11 is stuck over on the, on the, why does it look like 9, 10, 12, 13, 14? Where is the number 11? So the 11 is the winger who um, typically stands on the blind side. So all that means is that they kind of have to be, there has to be a call or a move to get them involved in the game because if you're just, Let's say you have a scrum. Let's say we're picturing a rugby pitch in front of us now. Let's say you have a scrum on the left-hand side and the ball comes out and it's passed to the 10 and she passes to the 12 and she passes to the 13 and he passes to the 14. It just goes in one long passing line all along and the 14, which is the other winger, gets it. So easy. Maybe it's just, we don't know what to do, so we just pass it. The 11 is never going to get the ball unless something has been planned for them to get the ball. Exactly. Um, but they also come in a lot as like support. So again, uh, you know, rock support or looking for an offload and they'll come in off their line. But um, 
that's kind of that's again like just to, to kind of talk about attack usually there's a, a call created to get them into the game um and then defensively oh, wingers have a tough job defensively let's say you're, you're a blindside winger and the, the opposite number eight comes marching down the blind side let's say you've 10 meters of space and the eight comes running and the six makes her tackle but the Opposition number eight has passed it away to the winger. You're, you have to, like, you're on your own there. Yeah, that's a very high pressure. You've got to make a decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got to read them well. You've got to use the touch line. So, you know, maybe, um, maybe show that player your outside shoulder so that you've got the, the, the safety of the touchline there to maybe push them into. It depends. Everyone has different skills and how they defend, but as a blindside winger, that's uh, tough going. If they decide to run at you, you've got to be ready and you can't be missing your fucking tackles, that's for sure. Because again, like I was saying about the number six, there aren't other players around you to like flock in to help because everyone's entitled to miss a tackle, really. Like it's, it's you know, it's shit, but that's what happens. But it's a team sport, so if you make a mistake, that's why you've got teammates to like lift you up and 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 support you and and pick you up off the ground. But there are some positions that are very highly, um, that are a bit more high risk than others in terms yes. of I'm not connected to the other players as as well as they are all connected. So I have to make my tackle. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's number eleven because it, as Anna described, when the ball is passed through, typically they. The typical route, 10, 12, 13, 14, 13 and 14 have at least each other in that. And, you know, players wrapping around in defense also can come because it tends to flow out in that direction. But mm. um, as you said, the barren lands, the, 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 that is the blind side. It could be a, a daunting task when it's you've got a 2v1 because your six maybe slipped off a tackle. And now you've got, ah, Christ, now i got to make a decision yeah. on one of these. Fucked. Yeah, fucked, you know. <laughs> or yeah, but you'll see it so many times. You go look back and look at highlight reels of of somebody like Keith Earls and the usage of the touchline. He isn't the biggest man in the world, but the usage of the touchline is a big thing. And these are body tells that a a, a a woman or man can show. As Anna said, like you tilting your shoulder, saying, oh, "I've got that." Are you gonna go gonna take that route up the outside? I'm gonna floor you over the touchline. Come on inside, and you want him to go back inside. So at least at least there might be cover coming across to give you a hand. But this is you. You want nerves of steel if you are the the number eleven, and that somebody breaks down your side because you got to make your tackle. There's just no excuse. So that's the reason why you were put there to be able to make your tackle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess yeah. So I guess that's eleven and fourteen kind of covered, and they do. You'll notice, as Anna said about the the fifty twenty two these days. You'll go, how are they back there? And they just know what's coming. They do. They just know it's coming. That big bomb of a kick. They just know it's coming. They can tell. And they're back there already. Um, so 12 and 13. Did we talk, did we talk about 50-22 already? I feel like we talked about it in a... Oh, in God, we did. We did, yeah. We talked about it already. Yeah, that was asked. Um, just very quickly, why yeah. the 50-22 was brought in. Oh, love um, Oh, it's such a great rule. It's so great exciting. Rule. It's like that. It's like that old school rule where it had to bounce before it went out. Yeah. God, it was so exciting. I remember just watching kicks like that down in in, in Muskegon or Tolman Park when I was young. Basically, teams have be, have become so good at defending because if you you know if you're attacking, you've got you're playing against fifteen players, and maybe one of those players will stand in the backfield, i.e., stand maybe ten to twenty meters back in case there's a kick, so that they can be back to to catch the kick. Um, because if there's no one there, teams will just kick over the top and run through and score. Now with the 50-22, if you like, if you're trying to win territory, you could kick to the left or to the right. So one player standing in the middle isn't enough. You need two players back. And what that's done is dropped one more player out of the defensive line, which means there's actually not only is this 50-22 kind of exciting and and an option there's actually more space to attack um, because there's one player missing from the defensive line. So it loosens up the, the, the for, for again, for an, a very blunt analogy that I'll make here, it loosens up the fabric. You know what I mean? It makes it, the holes in the net a bit bigger by having yeah. pulling one person out. Now, some of yeah. the humans have gotten bigger, so they're filling, 
they're filling the gaps. Well, that's I, why they had to change it because the defense has been so good. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it does. It has opened up things, and it it makes it a much more dynamic, fun thing to watch. And you're like, oh, this could be a. F-. And I love when the ref says, "Oh, fifty twenty two on here," as the ball is floating through the air. It's like, oh god, another another yeah. string to the bow of of excitement in the game. So we'll yes. move uh, 12 and 13, two different positions, but both known as centres, inside and outside centre. 12 being yeah. inside, outside being 13. Um, yeah. Two um, very different positions, typically. Uh, give us 12 so far, Stana. Um, 12's rule has changed a lot kind of um, in recent years and again will change from team to team depending on how how people want to attack and also how teams defend, like are you going to use the, the 12 or the 13 to crash the ball? Because essentially the centres are notorious for crashing the ball. So um, let's crash, say... Off crashing, the, the, crashing the ball, just to give a... just to, yes. Let's dumb this down. Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. I yeah. thought you were going to explain it. No, I to want crash, you to explain to cra- a crash ball. To crash the ball means to just run with the ball and look for the tackle. Yeah. But you're trying to get over the gain line, so you're trying to give a really good carry, but you know that you're probably going to be tackled, so you're just looking to drive your legs, win as many meters as possible, you see will get tackled. A crash basically means that there will be contact and there will be a rock. Yeah. So the forwards need to be ready to, to if it's coming off a scrum, let's say if I'm the seven and I know that there is a crash ball coming and it's probably called, you know, it has a name in my team, so I know what that is. I know that the it could be the 12 or the 13, either of the centres is going to just run with the ball into traffic. There will be a tackle, and I'm the number seven. I'm going to be the first player off the scrum, and that tackle is going to be made probably close enough to me um, because that's where the defence and the attack will meet. I've got to be the first person there to, to clean out that and support that ruck. Um, because if I'm not there and the tackle has been made, it's very easy for the 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 defense to maybe poach the ball. Yes. Um. So crash ball, very standard center behavior. They just run with the ball into traffic. They want to be tackled, but they want to win gain line. Um. So they just need to be very strong carriers and like crash it up. This is a big they, just they, and typically typically what you'll find and it was 12 I played for a long time typically what you find is you take pride in straightening the line and this is a phenomenon that tends to happen if the ball is being passed sideways as it's allowed the only allowance it is is to be passed sideways or slightly backed away people can sometimes drift you know you're all drifting off to the right if the ball is coming right and a 12 can often take it upon themselves which helps to so you don't run out of fucking space is to actually turn square and actually now run you know, perpendicular or, or or parallel to the to the touchline to straighten things up so that it makes it for a shorter distance for the support players to come back in around to support you. Because if you're all fucking drifting off, you look like under 10s <laughs> and yeah. you'll all end up in the corner. It's a nice mindset to have because if you know that you're a crash ball player, you don't mind being tackled mm. because the reason players are running across the pitch is because they're trying to avoid the tackle. Yeah. But if you just know, I know my role, I'm going to run into this fucker, he's going to tackle me, but I'm going to carry it so well that I'm going to get over the gain line anyway. Like, that's a nice mindset to have for, yes. you know, the centres will have that. They fucking know, like, uh, Bondi Aki and, and, and Gary Ringrose and Robbie Henshaw, they know... They're not slicing through every time. Now Ireland has done a good job. A lot of the a lot of the teams have done a good job where there's so much confusion for the defense. They're not sure who's going to carry the ball, and eventually a centre will slice through at some stage. But generally, the plan is nice. um, the 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 defense is probably set up well enough to cover you. Okay, cool. I'm covered. My, my we're not going to avoid this situation. We're going to meet it head on, and I'm going to try and win as many meters as possible. And if I do that well enough. Then the rock, the defensive um, setup is hopefully going to be slow to set up. Yes. I'm going to present the ball quickly. The seven is there to, to clear out. The scrum half is ready to pass and we can play quickly. Because if you get a really good crash or punch, you might call it in the middle of the pitch, um, you might take hopefully more than one defender out of the game. So if you've got someone like Bundyaki like storming down the fucking middle of the pitch, often one player isn't just enough to stop him. You need one player going on his legs, one player going around the ball, 
uh, and maybe even one more player if, if it's a really good carry to stop him. That's now three players, and that's what his centre is trying to do, take as many players out oh, of the game. I'm, three I'm players in that so tackle. Excited. <laughs> as you described yeah. that, I'm like, fucking yeah. Fuck, yes. Fucking yes. Three players three. out of the fucking game. Ball ready. Off we go. There's got to be space somewhere because those three fuckers had to take Bundy down. Yes. So yes. that's the plan. Fucking, I love it. I, I'm, I'm getting very excited at the notion of that. So, I mean, <laughs> a bit more flamboyancy then uh, as, as we move closer to the wing, but it's typically, I mean, they're hard workers too, is the 13, which is a very odd place defensively to, to be. I mean, we're not going to go into the, the minutia of it, but the 13s typically, or am I wrong? They typically tend to score more tries. They t- typically tend to have a, a few more flashy moments. Would they do yeah. Yeah, they can do. Um, again, it depends on the style that the team is going for and kind yes. of the nature of where rugby is at at that time. But I do feel like, yeah, at the moment, the 13s definitely are able to, because defence, as a defensive side, you cannot, you can't ignore the first threats and the 12 there is the first threat. Yes, so depending on what the 12 does and how the 12, the 10 and the 12, and maybe the inside winger has behaved, maybe all of them have been able to engage defenders to be like, oh, fuck, and therefore outside the space has opened up for someone like the 13. So, yeah. That's, really, that's, that's a great that's, description. Yeah. So that yeah, great. so that, that that's a typical great description of how things can unfold for a 13. And, of course, you need a 13 who has the silky skills of somebody like Gary Ringrose. Good God almighty, like the man can, he picked the ball off his shoelaces like and, and still stay going for a tall man. Um, mm. And again, similar roles, but they do shore up the centre of, the centre of the field as it runs out the way. So we'll move yeah. into, I suppose, the, somebody again, much like I suppose the blindside winger, the number 15 has to be a rock solid. And I mean, th- no jitters on any scenario. Yeah, very high pressure um, position again because, yeah, they're often, you know, if we're talking about, you know, the team breaking through that line, the 15 is often, Hugh O'Keenan has been unbelievable at this, the last line of defence. You've to make that fucking tackle because there's been some disconnect, some link missed, and a player came through, and if you miss your tackle, then that's it. That's it, they will score a try. It's it's certain. Whereas if you're in, if you've missed your tackle up the field somewhere, you'll get away with it. Yeah, it's it's shit that you missed your tackle, but you might not be punished immediately. But if the if the fifteen misses her tackle, you'll be punished immediately. Yeah. Um. The fifteen also generally has the role of um catching the high balls. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's so hard because there's so much pressure on, and you have to just like. First of all, catch it. Second of all, catch it like safely. And third of all, return to ground safely because there's so much traffic coming. Um, so again, if you drop it, chaos and you, you're putting your team under an awful lot of pressure. But the best thing about the 15, like the 15 is so interesting in attack because, you know, you've got your back line set up. Uh, you know, if you're 10, you look up, if you're in, in defense now against Ireland, you'll see your 10. Let's say there's a scrum. Johnny Sexton is there. You'll see the two centers. You'll see the outside winger. And then there's a fullback hanging in behind somewhere. You don't know where they're or when they're going to enter the line. Because he's coming so in that, like an arrow. Yes, you can't. That's, yeah. That's what creates the doubt. You don't know, is it my tackle? Is it his tackle? Is it her tackle? Like, is I'll, that my player? But he could come in anywhere he wants. I'll, and how... Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, just sorry, I'm, I don't mean to cut across you, but it will fall out no. of my head. Ala, uh, uh, Finley Bealham and himself linking. Do you remember that try? It was absolutely no. glorious. It was during the warm ups. Who was it? Oh, good God, was it against England in the warm ups? Oh, yeah. And it was this glorious link up between, and nobody saw Hugo Keenan coming. I don't know, can the man turn invisible or what? But he came absolutely gunning through between the, the rock. And Finley Beelham. Yes. And and Finley Beelham gave yes. oh, the most glorious back out the back door. They call it out the back door pass. Literally around the back around his back. He gave this pass that nobody saw. And nobody saw Hugo Keenan coming through like a bullet. 
but it, it's just to reiterate and his point is that a really good fullback will nearly almost be like an assassin they just come out of the darkness and they they can hide in shadows behind big players and then all of a sudden boom they're through the gap and he's such a beautiful runner that you because he's a sevens player he's got those long rangy you know antelope it looks legs. like he's making no effort nothing he glides across uh, once upon a time a, a young Simon Zebo used to run a similar way they don't yeah. seem like their studs are even touching the field they're just like gliding it's like what is this phenomenon I'm looking at it's it's yeah. ridiculous that's like Emer Considine as well yes, he was always yes. like oh my god Emer will you will you come on but she it was just she made it just look so easy she was just like gliding through people and then it looked like, oh right, she has it under control. <laughs> um, but this is back to it. <laughs> uh, like a dementor. Do you know a dementor? Yes, just like floating exactly around. like a dementor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or Marticia Adams, how she used to just she yes, didn't walk. Yes, she just yes, floated similar. around the house. Um yes. so that I mean that 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 has covered us one to fifteen. So I suppose to wrap up, there are seven on the bench, and there are a couple of forced necessities that must happen on the bench. Anna, isn't there? You can't just go, I'm going to have six wingers. <laughs> you can't. You're not allowed to have six wingers, but you can have obviously seven forwards, as we found out. But there mo- there's yes. a, there isn't, a, there is a, there's a, 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 a written in stone rule that you must have at least, um, is it a front row? You must obviously have a full front row cover a now. Full front row, there, yeah. But there used to be seven, um, there used to be just 22 players in a match day squad, so seven subs, but now it's 23. Um, but it depends on the league as well. Like in 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 um, like the the English Championship, there's only there's a smaller number of substitutes. Like they can change it between. It's not one set rule for rugby. It can change between tournaments and championships, etc. Oh. Yes. Um. But uh, yeah. Now it's 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 eight subs, and like generally, unless you're a Razzie fucking Erasmus, <laughs> you'll have five forwards and three backs. So what's useful for those players is that they might be able to cover two positions. Um, they're kind of, you know, which which makes it tough for substitute players as well because, you know, you're trying to be a, a player that can offer a lot. But if you're if you're there saying like, oh yes, I can cover second row and back row, you know, coaches might consider you then a good substitute player, and and you know, substitute players can be have a difficult role as well. Um, I really like how Razzy Rasmus has changed the um like the, the the role of a substitute, you know, with the whole bomb squad thing. So Oh he definitely are- he definitely did yeah. that a, a few years back. He did they're starters and finishers now. He doesn't call them and now everybody kind of does that. You're a starter. Sometimes yes. you might have potentially your better player to close out the game on the base. Yes. On the, which I love the notion of that actually. It makes it yeah, very I- a very yeah. a, a communist, communal kind of thing. Like, okay, I'm all right with having 21 on my back or whatever, you know. Yes. But always it's, you know, it's you have to be unselfish as well. Like, yes, you might be disappointed that you didn't get a start because generally starting players get to get more play time as well because you can't just change the game halfway through. You know, it's not like half time, all the subs come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you have to see how the game is going and, Often for a substitute, you don't know what that's going to look like. So you just have to kind of wait. And then, like what happened to me in the in the fucking World Cup in 2017, like uh, Claire Malloy got a concussion like 10 minutes in and I ended up playing 70 minutes, which I wasn't, you know, you're you're prepared for, but I wasn't expecting it. Of course. And that happens a lot as well. You know, I, I saw, I can't remember who this was, but I remember a substitute player getting player of the match because they had to come on so early and they made such a... And they played so fucking well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's so rare, really, because generally the substitutes, you know, you'll wait till the second half. Um, and you could have to come in for an injury, and then that's difficult because you you want to get on the pitch, but your teammate has been injured to allow you in. So being a substitute, like it's not just about, oh, cool, I'm a finisher now. Like that's um that makes me feel better. Like it's still a very yeah, difficult role. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't be feeling sorry for yourself because the team needs you to be positive like bigging up the starting team you usually hold the the rocking pads for the starting team to make their hits in the warm-up and your role you, you know everything around your what you do on how you behave on the match day changes as well whether you're starting or or you're finishing shall we say let's use that term um but you know the whole bomb squad thing about like oh we're so excited for these substitutes to come on like that's cool 
that was a cool kind of mindset to have like brought into the game of rugby. Um, Razzie isn't the only one to do it either. I know Eddie Jones, like, of um, course, yeah, as well, and, and a few other coaches. And, um, but you do need a front row cover. Um, legally, probably, like, uh, as part of the rules, don't you need people who are actually the laws? Don't upset yeah, the people la- now. Sorry, sorry, the laws, upset about the, that. I don't give a fuck. I know. Um, the laws, but you do have you can't just rock up and look like Craig Casey and go, Oh, I'm I'm a prop. You have to literally have it down in writing that you qualify as a prop. I don't know if there's actually time in the saddle you have to do like a driving test or something, but you have to be physically down on the no, pay- team sheet, don't you? You have to be you have to be uh actually able to play because if you are called in and you can't play, then you 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 fibbed on your on your you know putting your your substitutes down. So like you'll have you'll have games called off in different leagues because there's no substitute props. Um, yeah, of course, and, because it's a safety concern more than anything, isn't it? If you can't you actually know, yeah. go, up, go up against yeah. these people, and you'll see it sometimes. Like there was a there was a complete hames of a scenario against when Ireland were playing down in uh, New Zealand. Um, oh. between what you were allowed to take on and what you were allowed to put off and they, New Zealand made a pure bollocks of themselves and they ended up with an unqualified player in the front row so scrums then had to go uncontested so they were just yeah. literally leaning against each other Maria as they'd say in Cork to yeah. you're kind of pretending but really if you put in your ball they can't contest it you just kind of putting it in and rolling it back the way so you get to run your set play as per so yeah which is shit because it's it, it takes out, it's a huge a huge draw. element of the game is gone, but so that as what as Anna was saying, there has to be three designated front rows, um, down on paper, have their have their credentials, and be officially able to take over the role because it's fucking dangerous if you're going up against Tom of. <laughs> Can you imagine not having your your as I say in 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 uh, what was it uh, snatch. Have you got the minerals going up against your man from Tonga? What's his name? It's Tom of Asina, is it? Oh my God. Like, <laughs> Ooh, Ben Tamafuna. <laughs> Tamafuna. My Lord God. The man, he's about 26 stone. <laughs> he has shoulders that you could actually rest two cars up on his shoulders like these. It, it, it is a very serious thing. Now, in the, for the remainders, the three. Uh, are typically backs, aren't they? If you go typical five and three on the bench, and one of those backs is typically, and this is will give you an insight into the importance of the role, is typically an out a scrum half, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, because scrum halves get very tired. Yeah, they're fucking doing an awful lot of work. Nap, so usually, they need a bottle. Yeah, they need to be put away to bed early. <laughs> tucked in. Tucked they in. have yeah their own special little wheelchairs. Cot, and a little cot beside out. the bed. <laughs> but yes, you're right. Usually there's a <laughs> I imagine James Ryan putting Craig Casey down to some <laughs> <laughs> now now and like do 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 like a mobile wind up. And Jefferson gives him back, he's like, Yeah, fuck off. And Craig Casey's like, I've got a beard. Hello. I've got a beard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um yes, there'll be a scrum half and then some like utility back, but it's often it's a player that can cover 10 and another position. Like and Jack then, Crowley, who's a, he's played center a bunch of times for, for Munster, which is by no mistake, yeah. I would imagine, leading up to the World Cup, I would say. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, which is, yeah, which is what you have to do. And then probably uh, uh, utility um, back three, and back three refers to the two wingers and the fullback. So, yeah. Tremendous. Tremendous. Well, I think I look as as per the positions. I mean, we we steered. We planned on doing this over twenty minutes, and and I'd say we've gone well over an hour because. But yes. there was no way. There was no way of avoiding it because, in all fairness, even skirting. I know it, there are so. It's not like talking about Gaelic football or soccer. There, everybody's position is so different. I mean, and vastly different for some people. Do you know? So it's we had to cover what we covered, and I hope people don't have too many questions left over but if you do have questions please on our you know either of our instagrams or twitter or whatever you want to do just just bang a note underneath it um and ask us or go hi i i i think you're wrong i don't think we are but anyway if we are we'd be delighted to hear if we are uh, we haven't called them uh, laws they what do we call them they're not rules they're laws are they yeah just to make Perfect. that official 
so nobody pisses the bed. Um, also, yeah, I people get very upset about that. Also, I don't care, nor does Anna care if you actually stand on the end of your bed and piss all over it. If you have a problem with how we describe things here, <laughs> because this is our podcast, and uh, you know, but in all fairness, we don't get those kind of people listen to this. Uh, Anna, that was class. I'm actually fair riled up now for watching a rugby match and watching it like a pure fucking nerd with a notebook and pen and actually <laughs> going yeah. co- and correlating everything Anna has, has taught us. She's we'll be watching it now and be like, she was talking absolute shite, that one. <laughs> but to be, look, we gave the very much, the general, general, if you are starting rugby tomorrow, this is what you would be told. By the time you get to number one in the world, Ireland, things can get a little bit different. Players can do a lot more and they, they have to have to add that much more value to to the team that they can do a bit more than just, you know, bend over and shove or swing a ball out the back. It is, you know, it, we all we can do is kind of give you the general overlook. But I think people with going over that. I think people would have a decent grasp if you had no grasp at all prior to now. Do you reckon? Well, well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, Neil, you're we shall to... see. Get off the fence now. Get off the fence. That was a class. And I, I, I have not found one. I've not found a fun or interesting one anywhere that has described exactly what we did. It's certainly run in the run up to the World Cup. So uh, we're Which... trying to keep it unique here, gang. Um, we will. We as this comes out, this will go out. Uh, what day? Tuesday morning. This Friday, we are hoping to do a a quick live pod and, and because we want to wait for the teams and everything to come out we'll do a live on Instagram so uh, Banana Capeless Tom O'Mahony on Instagram and we want to do a live one maybe 15-20 minutes quick overview of what a preview I should say of what we're thinking well, things may lay out very interesting week ahead with team selection and all the rest of it so we don't want to do it before we don't want to pull the trigger beforehand until Friday evening if we can get it pulled together but uh, other than that in it that was absolutely smashing. I'm still very excited about the whole number 12 talk. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. That seems Unreal. to be a 12. Feeling, feeling it again. Feeling the powers. Powerful. Mind yourself. It's the banana and bear.